All right, everybody, how's it going? Uh, just want to say hello. Uh, my name is Mark Anstead. I do business development over at Fuji Finance. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about the evolution of an application. Uh, so, but before I get started, uh, I know it's been a, a, a very busy last couple days. So uh, to everybody in the audience, thank you for joining and, and listening in. And hopefully uh, you guys learned something new and uh, have been able to learn something new over the last couple days. So uh, let's jump into it. So going over a little bit of the history of just applications in general, um, we're going to be talking about how applications have sort of evolved over the last couple of years or last few years and where I sort of see them evolving uh, moving forward. So moving back a few years, uh, the first large application uh, on Ethereum really launched back in 2016. This is known as the DAO. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this DAP that was launched didn't really have the, the best outcome. Uh, ended up getting hacked, uh, but and this ended up creating uh, the, the creation of Ethereum Classic. Um, and then shortly thereafter, the first mainstream application that was launched uh, was in 2017, very well known as CryptoKitties. Uh, this basically clogged the entire Ethereum network, became super popular, and everybody was trading it, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, and then after the boom of uh, all these ICOs that were happening in 2017, uh, many DApp developers, they needed to de determine which network that they were going to be going and deploying different types of applications to. And if we go back a few years, uh, there were a few different networks that people could look to, uh, to deploy on. So if people were around a few years ago, some of these networks uh, might seem a little bit familiar or uh, maybe dated. So like Ethereum, EOS, uh, Tron, Steemit, Clayton, um, even Neo. Uh, some of these things don't really exist for the most part anymore. Uh, but obviously, around that time, Ethereum was the biggest and the baddest of them all. So why did so many applications go and deploy to Ethereum? Uh, you could go and permissionlessly deploy and build virtually anything. It had the largest developer community. Um, a lot of the tooling was beautiful. Um, it was the most mature, secure, and decentralized chain out there. So all of these developers were like, this is where we have to go and deploy. If you're deploying anywhere else, you're probably not doing it properly. But, as many people know, life on Ethereum isn't necessarily perfect. I mean, I, I'm, I've been a builder on Ethereum, I love it, but it's got its flaws. Uh, during that time, uh, there were a lot of gas spikes. We still have gas spikes today, though we're looking to uh, improve on that. Uh, but back in like 2017 and 2018, there was a huge gas spike around CryptoKitties, and then coming into 2020, uh, with DeFi summer, it was absolutely insane. Just going and making like a regular ERC-20 transfer, sending like USDC, could cost you as much as like 50 to $100. It was, it was brutal. And that led to some of these memes saying these gas prices are too damn high. It was, it was not fun for your, uh, for your ETH that you had to spend. Uh, and this essentially evolved into what's known as the multi-chain thesis. Uh, basically, every single DAP developer uh, realized, okay, with all these fees just getting absolutely insane, we would be crazy just to stick to Ethereum, because if you do, most likely some of your activity is going to decrease because it's becoming too expensive for some of your users. And developers, they needed to look for alternatives. And since Solidity and the EVM became the norm, um, a lot of these other chains started to get uh, activity and people started to deploy to them. And some of these retail users were like, oh, this is, this is a little bit nicer. It's a little bit cheaper, it's a little bit faster. And some of these side chains started to get a lot of growth. So like BSC, now known as BNB chain, Polygon POS, uh, XDAI, Phantom, and even Avalanche's C chain. Uh, they all started to really flourish and grow in terms of activity. But with a multi-chain uh, thesis, there are going to be different types of pros and cons. Obviously, you have better throughput, uh, you have lower fees, you're still able to have EVM compatibility, uh, and you have a new community that you're able to go and market to. 
Some of the cons are fragmented liquidity, and obviously you're not really going to be secured by Ethereum. You have different types of security assumptions. And this actually ended up giving the rise to different types of L2s. I mean, I'm not going to lie, I'm very biased. I am a huge L2 bull. I have been for, for quite some time. Uh, and many of these networks during this period of time, they were heads down in development. They weren't actually production ready. Um, but uh, some of these solutions are now starting to, uh, to evolve and come into production. Uh, so some of these are like optimistic rollups and ZK rollups. Um, I'm a big fan of both of those solutions and some of the teams that are building them. And the TVL for them are starting to explode. And so why are some of the teams going and now building on layer two? Well, it's cheaper than Ethereum, similar to some of these EVM side chains. It's secured by mainnet, so any transaction that's occurring, uh, you're still able to have security of Ethereum. Um, it's faster, can still support the EVM, and a lot of the tooling can be very similar. So for some of these like optimistic rollups as an example, you can have what's known as EVM equivalence. That means that you don't have to have any type of changes uh, to your code to go and deploy it onto these types of networks. And even some ZK rollups uh, are working towards that as well. But uh, with this multi-chain thesis and L2, it is still causing problems. Uh, liquidity has now been fragmented. Uh, so if you're a user uh, building around DeFi, uh, it can get a little bit hectic, especially if you're playing around with significantly larger amounts of capital. This liquidity is now separated on all of these, all of these different silos and these different, I would just call them verticals. Uh, so on all these different networks like Ethereum, BNB Chain, Tron, Arbitrum, Optimism, Polygon, Avalanche, Phantom, um, all of these different solutions, they all have their own isolated ecosystems. They can't communicate with one another. It's a big problem. And as we're looking to really scale out uh, these ecosystems as a whole or these types of applications, it becomes a problem. And as new L2s uh, are able to be deployed, it is a permissionless process to deploy an L2. This fragmentation, it's only going to continue. And this has now led to a new breed of type of application that we've seen over the last, I would say, like six to 12, maybe even 18 months. Uh, and these are different types of cross-chain applications. And the goal of them is to really abstract away the use of individual types of networks to optimize the user experience and if you're like a DeFi application, to unify the liquidity that has now been fragmented. So we're gonna just take a quick peek at a few examples of a few teams uh, that are focusing on these types of solutions, uh, which is uh, Sushi, or Sushi Foundation, uh, LeFi, uh, Fuji Finance, uh, I will say I'm a little bit biased there, I'm on the team at Fuji, uh, as well as Radiant Capital. So starting off with Sushi, um, for those of you who aren't really familiar with Sushi, uh, they did sort of a vampire, uh, vampire attack to Uniswap back in 2020 during the mid of DeFi summer. And uh, they were really only deployed to Ethereum. They went through the same life cycle. They were a single chain, then they went multi-chain. They were like, okay, if you're any type of EVM compatible network, Sushi is deploying there. That was like their mindset. And over the last six to 12 months, they've taken a very different approach because they have all of this liquidity and all these different networks, but it's all fragmented. So they've been working with actually the Layer Zero team uh, to build what's now known as Sushi XSwap, where you can not only bridge assets uh, across different networks, you can also swap uh, through the different types of Sushi Swap pools. So you're able to access the liquidity on all of these different networks. And one of the cool things about it is you can view the route with how like the, uh, the trade and the transaction is actually occurring. And so it, it really helps to make that user experience a lot better. It's helping to unify the liquidity when you're going to make these trades. Another one is LeFi. They've sort of taken a similar approach uh, to SushiSwap around cross-chain swapping. Although they have gone, I would say, a, one step further uh, in terms of what they are offering because not only are they a cross-chain swap aggregator, similar to like Paraswap, 
uh, or one inch or Dex AG, but they're also a bridge aggregator. So they go and aggregate all of the different types of uh, liquidity layers and messaging layers to essentially go and offer not only the best bridge, but also the best swap for you as a user. So different types of applications are starting to integrate with them and build on top of their SDK. So one of the things that's actually really cool that, uh, that, that they're working on right now, uh, which for me as a user, outside of just swapping ERC-20 tokens, which um, I, I do fairly frequently, uh, is the ability to go and purchase uh, any NFT from any chain. So for me, like I primarily use Ethereum and many of like the L2s on Ethereum, um, but I might not be using some of these side chains that uh, some of these NFT projects are going and deploying on. Well, with LeFi, with one of the things that they're working on, you will then be able to go and just have your assets on the origin chain and go and say, I want to purchase this NFT on XYZ chain. And your funds from the origin chain can be swapped into a bridge asset or just bridge the uh, origin asset and swap into uh, another asset to purchase that NFT. And that can all be done very seamlessly from the end user's experience. So making that process a lot simpler. Another example uh, is Fuji Finance. Uh, we are building, I should say we, I'm on the team, uh, we are building a cross-chain money market aggregator uh, where you can deposit, borrow, and repay a position from any chain. So one of the things that we have, have seen over the last uh, couple of years since um, the lending markets have really started to evolve and essentially gone multi-chain is we're starting to see new smart contracts getting deployed on all these chains. We're seeing new networks being deployed. And all these money markets, they're, they're fragmented. And so the Fuji team is essentially looking to unify all of this liquidity um, and allow you to access it through, through one interface. Uh, so you can go and essentially optimize either your yield or your borrow rates from all of these different types of money markets. Another example, which has actually gotten uh, a lot of hype, I would say, recently, especially on crypto Twitter, uh, is Radiant Capital. Uh, they are building what's known as a omni-chain money market. So you can deposit and borrow an asset from any chain. Uh, they're actually building on top of, of layer zero. And currently, the, uh, the money market that they are working on, this V2, it's not live just yet. Uh, their V1 is live on Arbitrum. And then their V2 uh, is going to be live uh, built on top of layer zero. So you can do all these cool functionalities. And it's really helping to make that user experience significantly better. And um, it just really helps out the end user and people that are building on top of these solutions. So the, the big question here, um, are, are cross-chain apps perfect? We're, we're probably moving into this uh, new paradigm where developers are going to start architecting and building their products to be natively cross-chain. Are they perfect? Short answer is no. But all of these teams are working towards being as trustless as possible, similar to any other type of normal application. Um, because none can be guaranteed to be perfect, not even Uniswap or Compound or Aave, the biggest behemoths of them all. None of them are technically perfect. Uh, we can strive towards perfection, but it's not guaranteed to, to happen. And these types of solutions, they're simply an evolution of application architecture to make the end user's experience significantly better and to help onboard more users and make this whole process uh, that much easier for, for users and developers to, uh, to build around. So uh, that's all I have for you all today. Um, again, thank you all for, for listening. Uh, my name is Mark Anson. I'm on the, on the Fuji team. And uh, yeah, I hope you all have had a, a wonderful time over the last couple days. And yeah, if you guys have any questions, feel free, like uh, raise your hand, you can, you can speak out loud, feel free. Uh, if not, thank you all for your time and uh, cheers. Do you have a question or? Oh, okay, cool. Thank you guys, enjoy.